Um, hello, I'm Ron Vale. I work at University of California, San Francisco. Um, also an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I come to MBL most summers. Came first to the MBL in 1983. And uh, I came here with um, my colleague Mike Sheets. And uh, uh, we came here to do some experiments on squid. We originally were going to do some experiments on squid and axonal transport, getting squid at the Hopkins Marine Station in California. Uh, both at that time, uh, I was a student at Stanford. Uh, Mike Sheets was a, a sabbatical professor at Stanford. And Stanford owned the Hopkins Marine Station, so that was the closest place to get squid. Uh, so we originally weren't planning to come to MBL, we were planning to do our experiments at the Hopkins Marine Station. And that year was a very unusual year. It was 1983. And uh, that year there was a meteorological disturbance, which we now know is called El Nino. At the time, El Nino actually wasn't even that well understood, but the waters of California warmed up. And the squid uh, basically left the coast of California. So we were waiting for several months to get any squid. And uh, Hopkins Marine Station kept calling us and saying, sorry, but can't get any squid this year. So after maybe five months of frustration of not being able to get some squid, we kind of spontaneously decided, uh, well, we're someplace we can get squid. So that was MBL in Woods Hole. So we called up and found out that there was a lab space available and kind of spontaneously decided to rent that lab and uh, two weeks later we were here. I kind of came to the field of motility really thinking about something else initially which were signals and how signals move inside of cells. At the beginning, I didn't know that much about motility, really. I, uh, so I would say that I grew to learn about it, you know, from that interest, you know, starting to think more about, well, how, how do things move in cells? If you want to get a signal from the nerve ter terminals to the cell body, I, the one thing that was clear is that there had to be some kind of directed transport going on uh, because diffusion would just not work at the scale of moving molecules over distances of what could be a meter in terms of, let's say, a large mammal. You know, the distance of the axon could be a meter long between the cell body and the nerve terminal. So it's pretty clear to everyone in the field that there had to be directed transport. But I was a newcomer. There's a fascinating question. I was a newcomer to it, so I basically had to learn about it. Um, but you know, I would say the, the, the what captivated me then and what captivates me now uh, is that, you know, motility is just simply one of the most fascinating things about biology. Uh, it, it's one of the most evident things that even a child understands about biological systems. You know, biology is full of motion. I mean, they're, animals move. When you put anything under a microscope, like pond water, you can see things swimming around in it. If you put a microscope at higher power in a cell, you see everything's in motion inside of a cell. Uh, you know, things like cell division, which you don't necessarily think of as movement, but it's full of movement also. Chromosomes have to move within the cell to align and then separate. So the more you look in biology, you just see motility everywhere, you know, that is defining how things get to the right place in cells, how cells themselves can move. So, you know, motility is almost like synonymous with life. And just one of the really basic properties about living things that make them work. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of a problem, I can't 
it's really one of the great problems in biology. And I also, also think it's very intuitive for most people to understand um, because even without much experience or knowledge or training in biology, people have the experience of understanding that you know, motility is one of the attributes of life. So I think trying to figure out how this basic attribute actually works, um, how you, you know, can create systems and machines and biology that carry out the analogous kinds of functions that we're used to on a macroscopic scale, i.e. moving us around by cars or other kinds of transport mechanisms, you know, trying to understand that, you know, that machinery at a very, very small molecular scale is just, you know, an inherently, I think, just wonderfully interesting problem. Well, you know, kinesin is one of those machines I just mentioned that, you know, has to carry out this function of uh, you know, moving, physically moving objects inside of cells. So um, it is a machine that takes chemical energy. You know, in a way that, again, is understandable uh, by the analogy of a car, too. A car takes, has to use some kind of chemical energy source. In that case, it's hydrocarbons. Uh, and then it, you know, has a machinery that converts the burning of those hydrocarbons into... Um, you know, physical motion of pistons, which then moves your car. Um, uh, you know, although analogy is not perfect, but, you know, these small molecular machines have to undergo a similar set of activities. They have to start with a chemical fuel. Um, in this case, it's kind of this universal molecule of energy that the cell uses for, you know, kind of a currency uses for many energetic needs, which is adenosine um, triphosphate, or ATP. And kinesin uses that energy source. It hydrolyzes it, so it breaks bonds, just like breaking down hydrocarbons. And it uses that energy, uh, you know, to move things in a directed way along tracks. Um, so the tracks inside of cells are obviously different than roadways, but, you know, they have an analogy, too. They're long polymers of uh, uh, proteins that create physical structures that can actually span across the cell. So one of these is microtubules, which are these long tracks, and kinesin moves along these tracks in a very directed manner. So it takes the ATP energy and it kind of marches along the track in a very purposeful unidirectional manner, but the main thing is it's carrying things with it. So it's moving cargoes from one place of the cell to the other. Um, in that case, it's actually moving in one direction along this microtubule track, and there are a whole other group of motors called dynenes that are moving in the opposite direction. So the cell basically has this whole transport system based upon tracks, which, you know, motor proteins can read in terms of their direction. So they, they know if, well, if they attach to a certain cargo and that cargo then uh, binds to the motor, the motor binds to the track, that cargo will get delivered by moving in one direction along that microtubule to uh, some specific location in the cell. Kinesin generally tends to move things from the cell interior to the cell periphery. And dynenes are moving things in the opposite direction. So there's a whole network, just like a city, you know, cargoes are being shipped from, you know, either from the suburbs to the city center or vice versa. There's a whole set of machinery that is, uh, you know, moving building blocks from the, uh, that are being produced in the cell to very specific locations. So that's what, you know, that's what uh, kinesin is, is doing. You know, so many people have stumbled into motor proteins from com wanting to understand completely different questions. You know, wanting to understand development or wanting to understand cell signaling or wanting to understand mitosis or wanting to understand, 
you know, the organization of cells, many of those problems at the end of the day have led them to an intersection with motor proteins um, because those phenomena, even understanding something in development, involves, uh, you know, physical motion of morphogens or RNAs inside of cells that need to be placed in a specific location in the embryo, for example, for some developmental process to take place. So uh, I think that's an example of how important motility is for the cell, you know, for a lot of basic organization and so many of the, you know, just fundamental processes of life, as I said, are not occurring in a homogeneous vacuum. They really require, um, you know, certain reactions inside of the cell or certain compartments of the cell to form in a very specific location. So a lot of these things are again like, you know, maybe like real estate, location, 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 right? And in, in many cases you generate that location by, you know, directing molecules of the cell to those specific locations, which again intersects with motor proteins. Now, so yeah, so I think the interest is that uh, motor proteins are intersecting with, you know, it's almost hard to imagine a part of cell biology that doesn't intersect with them. And what, as I said, it's been interesting just to see how many people have begun to study motor proteins, not necessarily, as I said, not because they're that interested in motility per se initially, but they found that their process involves some kind of molecular motor that is, you know, inherently important. People have, so again, I would say in terms of disease, people have come to motor proteins from a couple different routes. One is that um, in many cases, people are studying some disease, like neurodegenerative disease. They find out, you know, what are the genes involved in causing that disease. And in many cases, they end up being motor proteins or proteins that interact very intimately with, motor, with motors to regulate transport. And um, so a number of neurodegenerative diseases have uh, been mapped to these motor proteins or, or their closely related genes. Um, there, in other settings, there are things like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a very prevalent disease. Now that's not in a kinesin, but that's in a related motor protein, uh, myosin. Uh, and uh, some very specific mutations in cardiac myosin uh, you know, affect the beating of the heart and give rise to this disease, uh, well known because some young athletes, for example, suddenly, you know, fall dead on the playing field and that's traced to a very specific mutation in a motor protein myosin. Other, pro other diseases involve respiratory function or infertility, uh, or even amazingly misplacement of major organs in the body, which are defects due to ciliary dynings. So, you know, a, a variety of human diseases are manifest because this motility system is very important. And if you have mutations in it, you, there are a number of serious, you know, consequences that can arise. Um, and there's also some notion that some neurodegenerative diseases may involve, um, you know, some kind of cumulative damage to the cell, to the axon that can result in impaired uh, transport of material inside of axons. So that's still a, a developing area uh, of research. But, um, uh, and also I've been involved in a company that uh, was started with a few of my colleagues, James Sabri and um, Larry Goldstein and Jim Spudich, even to try to manipulate these motor proteins to um, correct uh, motor protein disorders. And um, that company is called Cytokinetics. And, you know, they've been very successful in developing small molecule therapies for motors. 
and now most successful for manipulating the myosins that are either in your heart or in um, skeletal muscle. Uh, so obviously I should you know, disclose I'm a founder, obviously, on the SAB, but they um, you know, have developed molecules that, um, uh, for example, patients with heart failure where their heart isn't sufficiently contracting, uh, amazingly, they found you know, small molecule drugs that you can take orally that are right now in clinical trials uh, but look very promising. And those actually cause the heart to contract better than normal. So it actually is a way of activating the mo motor to have enhanced performance and cause the heart to contract more vigorously and pump out blood from the heart uh, much better. So people with a kind of a failing heart that can't contract, we're hoping that the manipulation of the motor will help them in that disease. And it's also being, there are other molecules that they developed that activate skeletal muscle. So uh, being tested in, first of all, patients that have failing muscular performance due, due to neurodegenerative disease, that that might give these patients more strength. And there are all kinds of other disorders of, you know, muscle or muscle weakness that may benefit, again, from activation of these motor systems. So, um, yeah, so I think there are all kinds of, you know, currently, you know, exciting, still in development ideas in which, you know, uh, also can help people by, you know, improving motor protein function. Like, I think all discoveries are built upon work of many people. Um, and this is just, you know, uh, another uh, good story of this. Um, also, I, you know, I must admit, I think I was very lucky. I, you know, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to be involved in that discovery, which is, again, I think true of many discoveries as well. And... Uh, um, you know, in many cases, discoveries don't require, you know, being a genius. I think it just requires, you know, the right ingredients to come together to make things happen. But, uh, I mean, first of all, being at the right place at the right time, there was, uh, MBL was the right place at the right time. There was, you know, fantastic work ongoing before, you know, I even arrived here by, um, uh, uh, Scott Brady, Ray Lassick, and um, Robert Allen. And uh, they were doing amazing work with a new microscope that Robert Allen developed called Video Enhanced Contrast Microscopy. Um, so they got the first really clear images of axonal transport that, you know, you, could, you can really see all the details of things moving in axons, which before wasn't that clear with earlier microscopy technology. So that opened up this whole like exciting, you know, window into what intracellular motility really looked like. And um, so, you know, I think Mike and I are very fortunate. Uh, and again, you know, my role in this wouldn't have happened if we didn't team up with uh, Tom Reese and, and Bruce Schnapp. Uh, uh, Tom had a year-round lab at the MBL. He was from the NIH. So he, uh, he was one of the, you know, at that time, few year-round investigators here. Um, you know, Bruce uh, was a very talented young scientist who uh, also, you know, used the um, kind of formula for video microscopy that uh, Robert Allen and Shinya Inoue developed, so he built his own video microscope. Um, and, uh, and then he and Tom are also brilliant uh, electron microscopists as well, which also figured in uh, to that problem as well. Um, I would say, I guess my niche is I was trained as a biochemist, and I, although I didn't really think of it at the time, uh, you know, a lot of biochemistry, I would say from older days, was often done with, you know, 
uh, pieces of equipment like radioactivity or spectrophotometers or things like that. That's how you assay things by biochemistry. And it just seemed like a natural opportunity to think of a new way to do biochemistry by actually almost visual biochemistry, you know, that instead of putting things in spectrophotometers or following things by radioactivity, you actually can, um, you know, develop assays, biochemical assays to follow molecules, but as I said, not follow them by radioactivity, but follow uh, an activity by fractionating things and then reading out, you know, what molecule might be responsible for that activity with a microscope. Uh, that's much more commonly done now, but I, I guess at that time that was, that was kind of an unusual way of doing biochemistry. So I, I guess uh, having been trained as a biochemist, but being in the right environment where you know, this was the best place in the world, I would say, for visualization of cell biology. Um, and putting those two things together, in a way, uh, was really critical for, for the discovery of kinesin. So the MBL has obviously had a huge impact on my career. Uh, I mean, all that work on kinesin, which got me a job, so uh, in the first place, you know, happened at the MBL. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, there were other things. I mean, you know, just coming here as a young scientist, as a graduate student, and just seeing kind of, and I was a, at a good institution. I was at Stanford, you know, so Stanford's, you know, good place to do science, but you know, you come here in the summer and you, there's just this tremendous like activity of science going on here uh, in the courses, in the labs, and uh, you know, it's infectious really. I mean, it's just like, it, it drives you to a higher level of science, you know, just to participate and be part of this, you know, exciting buzz going on here. So I think that flavor of science was very influential. I would say almost the converse, which was very interesting as well, almost the exact 180 degree opposite was part of the Kinesin purification happened here uh, in the winter of 1984. And it was exactly the opposite of the summer because, I mean, there was no one here, uh, you know, the Whitman, now Row building, was shut down. The Tom had a lab in the Lur building, but that was it. There was one small lab with a few people there, no one else in the building. Um, uh, and there was, you know, no seminars here. There was uh, the kid, Captain Kid, was shut down. There was, you know, nothing to do in town here. And, um, but, that was also a very interesting experience in a way, just to be kind of just alone with one's thoughts and just really focus in this very monastic way on a scientific problem. Well, I came here a couple times as a course instructor for a short amount of time, like in maybe 92, 93 for a couple weeks. So I had some taste of what it was like to teach in a course here, but doing the physiology course for five years as a co-director with Tim Mitchison, um, I think also was life-changing for me, and I can explain why. When, because now I'm very involved in a, a lot of educational activities. Uh, I would say that's, you know, a a major part of who I am now is thinking about and working on education, not just research. But I would say before I became a course director, I was m marginally interested in education. And I always saw education from the viewpoint of being a lecturer standing in front of a hundred students and never entirely feeling like I made the connection that I was, you know, either 
that good at or feeling that invigorated by that lecture experience and um, experiencing in a in a in a full-on way you know the and being responsible for the MBL course really made me uh, excited about education um, realized how creative education could be real made me realize that there are other models that are just so much more engaging and interesting for working as a partnership I would say but as between teacher and student in a way that's exciting for both um, uh, you know because that's what the flavor of the MBL courses is like it's really I would say it's almost a partnership where in many cases students become teachers teachers become students it's an it's an apprenticeship environment where everyone's um, you know, trying to learn the practice of science, not just transfer information in a unidirectional manner, like through a lecture. And um, so I, 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 I would say uh, that was also an amazing influential experience for me at the MBL. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to tell you about iBiology. And uh, I should also add, we come to MBL every summer to record speakers here. So we just finished two weeks of recording here at MBL. Um, MBL is a great place to do it because we can capture so many people that have come to MBL in the summer, as well as some speakers from Boston. So it's it's also become part of our M, you know summer MBL routine. Uh, we're very grateful to the MBL for allowing us to do that. Um, yeah, I would say, I be, well, maybe I could start with a story of how iBiology started because I think that, you know, it exemplifies the reason why we're doing it. Um, I uh, went to give a seminar once in India. You know, I flew 25 hours to get there, 25 hours to get back. I spoke to 150 people, which was a great experience, but it was at the most elite institute in India. And you realize, wow, I went a long way to talk to very few people at the most elite institute in this country. And how many other people, you know, were there in India that I didn't reach? So, you know, I just began to think that, you know, this science communication is so important. Um, listening to scientists talk about their work is such a different experience than reading a paper, or reading a textbook. And uh, it's also a system that we've kind of sheltered in a way in elite institutions that can afford to fly speakers uh, or, you know, even have the cachet to attract leading scientists to come there. And there have to be there have to be and there should be better ways which we can make you know the ideas and voice of scientists more freely available so that you know people can hear them around the world or even in the US at a lot of everything from high schools community colleges small colleges liberal arts colleges you know geographic locations that may not uh, be able to attract top speakers. So that's what, you know, got me interested. And I think I still think that's, you know, the main mission of iBiology that, you know, we'd like to make, you know, the oral communication of science more widely available, freely available, um, so that people can, quote unquote, meet scientists who are doing the work that is often, you know, in the textbook. And also just hear how scientists think about ideas and approach problems, which is an incredibly valuable, you know, thing to learn. Um, so, yeah, so that's our mission. I mean, it started off very small, you know, with a $2,000 grant. When I came back from India, I got that $2,000 grant. And it's kind of been, uh, you know, uh, marching forward steadily since. And, um, you know, now we have like over, 
at least six million viewership per year, and it's growing considerably every year. You know, we have about 50,000 subscribers. And I would say also the interesting thing about it is it's just like research. It's creative, or it's constantly changing every year. We're trying new experiments of what to film and how to present material. So, um, you know, we're really also trying to, you know, not just have a formulaic approach to, I would say, video-based education, but, you know, really trying to experiment, uh, learn from it, and, you know, come up with different ideas for scientific outreach through this media. And, you know, in, in my view, that makes, you know, kind of this education thing, which again, I come back to from the MBL, tremendously creative. You know, if you really want to do a good job and, um, you know, explore new ways to educate people, this is a tremendously interesting and rewarding activity. Um, and it requires that same kind of, I would say, creative mind that we th associate with research, but it's also relevant for, you know, so many other problems. Um, so anyway, I love this project too, just as much as our research project. And it's, it's really, I'm really glad it's helping many people. And it's also really a, a fun thing to keep growing and innovating every year as well. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I mean, I like science history, so <laughs> I would say yes. Um, and But it's an interesting question to come up with a thoughtful answer to it. But, I mean, first of all, I think right now there are a tremendous number of interesting ideas in the literature that, first of all, often get totally forgotten. In fact, uh, I would say, you know, even a good formula for coming up with a good problem in science right now, which a lot of young people are trying to do, obviously a key thing is to figure out before you start working on a problem, what's interesting and what's a good niche for me and even something what's not overpopulated so I can actually make a difference. Um, there's a lot of great problems that have been tackled in science already that maybe have been dropped or there's been a lull in activity um, that may be ready for revival uh, with modern technologies, for example. So I think the scientific literature, the quote-unquote historical scientific literature, is just a great resource for thinking about interesting problems that may be ready for re-exploration. And I think people that are willing to do that are going to have an edge, actually, because so many people don't read, uh, you know, earlier scientific literature. And even earlier doesn't even need to be that many years ago. I mean, so many a lot of people, a lot of students even, I think, like, oh, you know, gosh, that was before 2005. I, you know, I'm not going to bother reading it because it's so old. You know, it's like a decade old. And um, I think that's a giant mistake, you know, because there are often ideas in these earlier papers. It's not so much just the techniques. Yes, the techniques are, have changed in the past decade, two decades, three decades, four decades. But in many cases, the ideas haven't, or even interesting hypotheses are, that are, were posed many years ago are still very relevant. So um, I think to really get, uh, to be equipped to think of what is important to study, uh, what might be the best choice of a problem for me to study, which I think is the most important thing for any scientist to do. I think understanding the literature and the historical scientific literature is very important and actually can give one a competitive edge, if you'd like, in you know, uh, defining your research program.
Well, again, if you look through the history of science, you find time and time again that you know new ways of probing living systems, new quote unquote technologies, new ways of getting information always end up resulting in like major new understandings of how living systems work. Uh, of course, many Nobel Prizes are awarded actually for new technologies in reality. Um, and, and I think what that allows you to do is, again, to approach a problem that's been around for a while, but at some level has gotten stuck. And, um, and scientists have a difficult time over coming that phase largely because they're somehow limited in what information they're getting from the system. So if there's a new technology that kind of breaks through that wall and you know allows you somehow to get new kind of information on the system, it always ends up being you know you know incredibly important. So I, I think now that's very well appreciated. There are many people, there are many institutions that are developing um, uh, technologies. Uh, there's some scientists who really exclusively focus on the technology. They're less interested in the pro problem. There are other people that are really interested in the problem. They kind of wait for other people to develop the technology. And then once it's well established, they import them port that technology to their to their problem. Maybe our lab has been a little bit of a hybrid of both. We're certainly not a technology lab. Uh, but if there is some technology that we can develop uh, with a particular relevance for something that we're actually a question that we're really interested in studying, then we won't shy away from trying to develop that technology if that's the best way for us to answer that question. So I guess we live in that hybrid world, but um, you know, gosh, look at CRISPR technology now. It's, that's a, you know, a technology, obviously it came out of some very, very basic fundamental research on what is effectively bacterial immune system. Um, but that technology is just sweeping across biology at a, a, for gene editing at a level that I've never seen before. So it's, it's completely changing what people, you know, can do to study biological organisms now. Again, going back to my own experience at MBL, it was a video microscopy that was a huge breakthrough technology at the time. And other advances in our career, some of which we've done, but Many coming from elsewhere in microscopy technology, again, have, you know, been monumental over the last 30 years uh, in, in how people can visualize biological systems, which has been amazing and still ongoing. I mean, we're still developing new imaging technologies, we as a community. Well, MBL is an amazing place because uh, you walk around here in the summer and you, you meet all kinds of amazing scientists on the street, uh, you know, walking around MBL at lectures. It's, it's just this incredibly exhilarating uh, uh, environment uh, for scientific discussion, really, that I don't see happening at this kind of level and this kind of intensity in other academic institutions. I mean, people say that, you know, MBL is the place where great ideas uh, come from, and it's really true. I think also people come here with the notion of really discussing and talking about science and learning from others. And so much of science is social, really. It's about coming up with ideas through, not by sitting in isolation and thinking great thoughts by yourself. Um, most, I would say, of my scientific ideas come through discussions with other people. And 
to be in a kind of enriching environment like MBL where you're just constantly thinking and talking and hearing science um, well not quite 24 hours a day because you have to sleep for a few hours here but not many hours but uh, this kind of invigorating discussion is uh, w what makes MBL just kind of almost a national monument of science in a way that uh, is very unique, um, you know, very special, and the reason, a major part of the reason why I come, uh, you know, to MBL every summer. Well, gosh, I mean, you know, the first time you take the bus and you just roll into town, that's the moment you realize <laughs> this place is pretty special. And, uh, you know, when you, you know, just walk around the MBL in your first few days here, I think everyone is just struck by, and with the realization that this is such an interesting, unusual place. Um, and, you know, of course, the more time you spend here, the more that initial, I think, reaction gets cemented in. You know, what's amazing to me is also how many students have come here, I think just expecting that they're just going to take a course. Uh, and then after that course is finished, realizing this was more than a course. This has really like changed my attitude towards science and has invigorated me, you know, to love being a scientist. And, and then say, gosh, you know, I have to come back to MBL because I need that, I need that shot of energy <laughs> and that love of science, you know, periodically in my life and try to reinvent themselves in new ways either as, or maybe I suppose as I did, you know, in, in new ways to come back to the MBL. But, and even when they come back, it's very much to capture that first magic that they first experienced when they walked through the campus for the first time.